session, the evolution of F and B. Um, we've got with us today, it looks like everyone's starting to log in. We've got Liam Doyle, who's the principal of Jump Studios. We hopefully, I can see Natasha, who's our moderator. Natasha is director of hospitality at Blue Rock Sports and Entertainment. Uh, we also have Rhett Kalidas, who is um, commercial director of Levy UK and Ireland. And hopefully, any second now, I've got messages coming in as well. So may, we should have Paul Cuttle from, um, he's vice president of stadium operations um, at Liverpool Football Club. So I might just log out, see if we can get Paul in and I'll leave Natasha to uh, start the session and do the introductions. Thank you, Katie. So, hi, I'm Natasha Thiebo, and I'm a director and one of the co-founders of Blue Rock. We're a venue consultancy. Uh, we work with venues on their commercial and oper operational strategies to help them innovate and to be more successful. So I'm joined by a, a great team, and I think it's quite interesting because we've got a very diverse team. We've got operators, caterers, uh, strategists, strategists <laughs> and uh, a designer. Um, so I think um, it'd be great if everyone just introduces themselves and, and tells us a little bit uh, about their, their role. So uh, Rack, you were the first in, I think. So do you want to kick off? Hi, Natasha. Thanks. Hi, uh, Rack Kalidas, Commercial Director for Levy UK and Ireland. Uh, I look after all our commercial activity within Levy. What does that mean? Um, I look after our brands, concepts and innovations. Um, and I also head up our design, build, and project management uh, for Levy. Okay. okay, and uh, Liam, if you want to take yourself off mute. Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liam Doyle, and I am a principal at Jump Studios, which uh, Jump Studios is a populist company. Um, my work in particular is to work alongside populists to um, almost redefine what the match day experience is, the event day experience from an interior's point of view. So I am a designer. And what we like to do with our work is actually always go against kind of what the convention is and what's happening and really make something more dynamic and exciting for the customers and the fans that are using those spaces. So thank you for having me today. Okay, that's great. And Paul, I can see you've arrived. So can I just ask you to give a quick introduction to yourself and your role? Hi, uh, yeah. Hello, Natasha. Hello, hello everybody. So uh, my name is Paul Cuttle. I'm the, I'm the uh, Vice President of Stadium Operations at uh, Liverpool Football Club, uh, which are delighted to be hosting this event, um, hopefully in September of this year. Um, so I've been at Liverpool now for 20 years, um, started very much um, running the catering, and that's my background is catering. More recently, in the last 12 to 18 months, I've taken on a wider role and I now look after all the operation at Anfield Stadium, uh, catering, safety, uh, all the maintenance and facilities management as well. So, pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Paul. And Roy, it seems like we've managed, we can see you now, which is fantastic. So, Roy, can I just ask you to give a quick introduction to yourself and your role? Yes, I'm founder and CEO of a company called Forward Associates. Uh, long background in hospitality, hospitality development, food and beverage, and guest experience. Uh, set up Forward Associates. We're a 20-strong uh, venue consultancy company. We support venues, most entertainment, sports venues, and leisure venues across all remits, uh, food and beverage, uh, guest experience, design, architecture, uh, commercial, technology, you name it. We sort of have an expertise in it. And uh, yeah, love where the world's going at the moment in terms of venues, but uh, obviously we've been very hit hard with COVID. So it's great to have these sessions to be able to discuss and still share our thoughts. Yeah, so lots to talk about. Um, so yeah, just, just to recap, so we're talking about um, the evolution of, of F&B. And as I said before, we've got a quite diverse panel. So we've got caterer, operator, designer, strategist. Um, and I mean, I work with venues all around the world on their, their catering and, and hospitality strategy. And I've thankfully, thankfully, in the 25 years I've worked in the venue business, food has dramatically changed. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me. There was a time when you, you know, you probably only ate in a stadium if you had to, right? You, you definitely didn't go there for the food. But you know, that's really, really changed dramatically. And I think particularly in the last sort of, you know, five or ten years. And with venues, I think there's now a real kind of 
realization of you know how important the food is to customers and their enjoyment of the event and also in in delivering the venue's brand experientially so Rack, I know uh, Levy are the catering partner of many of the, you know, the, the best known sports and entertainment venues. What are some of the new F&B concepts that uh, you've introduced or you've been working on recently? Well, the first one I want to talk about, and Roy and I worked together on this, well, going back four or five years ago now, Roy, right, uh, is the O2 Arena. Um, there was a master plan that was drawn up for GA catering uh, on level one. And really the idea around that was about enhancing that overall fan experience and journey. Um, typical style venue with hole in the wall uh, catering, you're dictated by your food offer by where you sit, um, slightly underdeveloped in terms of where, where the industry was going. And Roy and I worked on this back, back about four years ago, whereby the master plan was dri uh, drawn up to create a multi-experience experiential concourse and what we mean by that is you know having multiple bars and food outlets within one space but giving different tiers of experience within that space um, and that was moving away from your hole in the walls so we actually filled the holes up and came out into the concourse we created island bars um, we created um, tiers of experience in the bar offer whether it was your high volume bar to your craft bar to your gym bar to your champagne bar and we created uh, some concepts called the kitchen. Um, and these were really, really um, exciting for us because now we were able to offer multiple food offerings within one space. You're not dictated by where you sit. You can walk all the way around the concourse. Um, but the really cool thing about this was we, we tailored the menus to the genre type of the venue. So there were six genres that were identified in terms of show type. Uh, that was matched with the audience profile that comes with all the data behind it. So it was, it was really, if we're really thinking about it, it was a data-driven uh, solution in terms of what we put into there. And a lot of work and research was done in terms of that profiling. Um, and to make it really cool through digital activation, we uh, created brands for each of the different genres. So you could go to a Bieber or you could go to a Metallica concert and the brand will look different as with the food offer, as with the pricing. So everything tied in together to the event type, which was really cool. And that's been hugely successful to us. And, you know, that concourse is still evolving. There are still projects that we're both involved in right now in actually bringing that to the forefront uh, much more. So yeah, very exciting space that was developed and the ongoing development of that is equally as exciting. And Roy, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a game-changing proposition because we actually studied, obviously, how high street restaurants worked and how they deliver fast volume. I won't say which we obviously got into the detail of. Uh, and then we worked out how we could take that fast uh, philosophy but apply it to what we would call high-quality food. You know, and I think really taking that principle of, as, as you stated, moving away from a hole in the wall to much, much more explored environment, much more open environment, uh, really focusing on how you could produce the highest quality of food, but still serve it out in the fastest possible way without ever compromising on the quality. I think yeah. you're right. Also focusing, it was probably our first real data-driven project, really right. focusing on different demographics and creating different uh, food menus that evolved in order to really align to those demographics also I think demonstrated how much food you you can you would sell you know mm -hmm. how much sales increased because it showed that if you gave people what they really wanted they would buy more of it <laughs> you know mm -hmm. I think the other fascinating thing on that particular project is that we were able to 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 take away even units away from the wall completely. So it was the first island bar ever to be put in a stadium uh, or an arena, sorry, in the UK, yes. in what I would, you know. So, so those kind of components were, were very much game-changing. And don't forget, this is an arena that had already formed this game-changing proposition when it first opened in 2007. So this was an arena that showed how even spending money on a concourse environment, it could really push the boundaries yet again, seven years later. Uh, and commercially, very, very good project commercially. But that was driven by offering people the right guest experience and the right food that they're looking for at that point in time because of the demographics and the shows that they were coming to. And as Rex said, tiering. Tiering was 
was the secret to that concourse. We've got everything from a champagne bar in a GA right through to fast serve beer bars, yeah. Mm, great. And uh, Liam, anything to add to that from a design perspective that, you know, how you've seen changes or how you've influenced uh, change? Yeah, um, I mean, I think just kind of carrying from what Rack and Roy are saying, so um, Jump Studio has worked with the, the guys in the development of that. And one thing I always love to do when I go to the O2, we have a box there. I love to nip down to the island bar to see how it's doing. And as they say, it's still absolutely rammed every night of the week. You know, it's, it's fantastic to see that all of the kind of collaboration that happened there uh, has really you know lasted and at the test of time. And I think Roy and I in particular, we worked very well together and very collaboratively on Tottenham Hotspur. And what the guys were doing, kind of working these two projects at the same time, where obviously one was a music venue and Tottenham is a, a football stadium. And I think the success of that and with all of these is we're always trying to redefine that match experience, that fan experience. And the best way to do that, uh, I believe from Matera's point of view, is the collaboration between the designer and the catering and the strategy. And if you can pull all that together, you guys can, you know, if you can work well, what you will have is gold because you will create experiences that are far greater than what you would have had if you worked independently. Um, mm. Certainly with Tottenham, one of the things we worked really hard on was getting rid of the, the hole in the wall because from mm. a design point of view, I know the, the hole in wall or the belly up, they are the backbone of all of these venues. But from an aesthetic point of view, well, wow. you know, they, they, they can be quite challenging. Um, so again, what Roy and I done there is we worked really closely to open them out, bring in that theater, you know, even having areas of display and shelving integrated brands, um, showing how the food was cooked and relaying that honesty um, really made that in itself a game changer as well. And you just have to look the success of that on a match day if you go down to the marketplace where you know we created a buzz around Europe's longest bar 65 meters and then you've got these four open um, kitchens which can develop and adapt to any menu and it's again that honesty about being able to see what you're getting um, and it's just a higher level of finish than you know what you would expect. Mm. That's great. I think one of the things that's really interesting that we've seen um, is, you know, you guys have touched on it, but it's, you know, moving away from the generic offerings, same food in every venue and, you know, that focus now on locality and differentiated food experiences. I know um, one of the ones I, I, I love seeing, I mean, I know it's not that new now, but um, the Barclays Centre in New York, which I know Levy worked on with the Taste of Brooklyn program and, and the way that um, Levy invested in and partnered with local food brands and restaurants. And, and I know, Rack, you're, you're doing something similar with Curb, is that right, with this kind of street food brands? We are, yeah. So Curb are our strategic partner in this space. And this is about bringing the most exciting street food talent together in a venue location. Um, again, giving fans a reason to come early with the diversification of food. Um, and it also helps the traders as well. You know, they get access to all these amazing venues. Um, it creates this incubator program to allow new traders to start up, test their products, etc. It's authentic um, and people, you know, street food's not going away. It, it's still here. We've been talking about it for the last five years. It's not a fad anymore. Um, people are relating it to a lot more now. Um, we saw before lockdown, the street food markets, the market halls, all that starting to re-emerge and really taking them through a program of, you know, incubating to accelerating and growing them to, to actually end up in a fixed unit. And we shouldn't be afraid to bring in these guys who do food really well and do it with such passion into our spaces. So you've got that hybrid of caterer and your strategic partner that's really helping bring food mm. to life. Uh, in these spaces and it's a really exciting time for us as we as we bring them on a journey into our venues fantastic and paul are there things you do with your food service that are you know really unique to liverpool football club um unique uh, i suppose we're in-house which is slightly different to other to other premier league um football clubs so so which gives us some benefits and some some not so uh, benefit uh, things but um it is relatively unique i think the other thing we do is we 
deliver all our food outside the stadium is done by ourselves. So all our external units uh, are owned by us, sort of whether that's uh, mobile H vans or we've got a yellow submarine and, uh, and even the, the containers, we actually own them ourselves. Um, we brand them though, that very much down a street food theme. Um, so there's no Liverpool Football Club branding on them, um, although they're operated by us and staffed by us. And for me, it's a bit, we, you know where you are when you're at Anfield, so there's no need to necessarily put Liverpool Football Club all over it. So I think that's one of the unique things we do. We've also now introduced an allotment into um, into our operations. So it's about 10 minutes from here in uh, the glamorous uh, area of Tubrook, um, just down the road. And it's about the third the size of um, a football pitch. It's a, it's a big space. Um, we grow our own fruit, veg. We introduced bees in there two, three years ago. Um, and produce our own honey. So, look, we're not generating all our food isn't being grown by ourselves, but it but it does allow us to use some of those products within some of our menus and the lounges. Uh, and then up until unfortunately we we hit where we got to in March uh, last year with lockdown, uh, we the intention is now to bring schools, uh, local community, and and we already give some of the food to a food bank uh, that's left over. But we're going to start just um, involving more people from around the area as well. Okay, fantastic. And Liam, have you worked on any interesting F&B partnerships or experiences? Yeah, I mean, I, I think just to kind of finish on what kind of Raf was saying earlier, this whole notion of bringing in the street food vendors um, from a designer's point of view is so exciting because you can actually help develop somebody's, um, you know, their ethos, their brand, what it looks like, how that becomes tangible. Um, and one of the ways that we'd done that, again, on Tottenham Hotspur was working with Beaver Town. Um, and what was so exciting about that was it, it wasn't just about bringing in a, you know, a really cool brand, which, which Beaver Town are, but it really strengthened um, Daniel Levy's vision of regeneration of North London. So bringing in an authentic brand that was North London based and actually creating a situation that you don't really have in any other sporting grounds you know the, the tap room itself and the brewery uh, is a really cool place to be on a match day um, and that kind of atmosphere and the synergy that runs through there it's all about North London pride um, mm. I think quite often what we, we need to be careful of is when we are connecting brands with sponsorship that they have to feel authentic because mm. the fans ultimately know um, and you know that one was a very successful partnership because you know, it was a North London brand. It was fantastic beer. Mm. Um, and that was, you know, also looking at consumer habits and how they were changing within the game. Yeah, I think you're so right. I think it's, you know, that authenticity, you know, it's not about slapping a brand on or, you know, just appointing a celebrity chef. It's got to make sense to the customer, yeah. right? It's got to connect with them. And so I think, you know, that's how you increase dwell times and get them to come to the stadium rather than, you know, staying out on the, the high street. Um, Let's turn um, to talking about premium catering. Uh, there was a great session earlier today uh, looking at future trends in, in, in premium. Um, some of the key themes that came out very much about flexibility and choice. So how are things changing with food in hospitality? What are customers looking for? Um, and how do we use food to create different levels of experience? So, so Roy, I know you work on the design of a lot of new um, hospitality programs. How, how important is f and in your, in your strategy? Um, I, I mean, f and is massively important, but obviously it's not our starting point. So just, just to point out, I think for us, it's really understanding and, you know, Rag touched on it, even at the O2 and Liam's definitely touched on it. You've kind of got to know what your strategy is as a venue, who your demographics are, what those demographics are looking for and how they're going to use the space. Once you've got that concept, and I've sort of made that a very light proposition, but there's a lot more obviously that goes into that. But once you've got your concept, food is an integral part that has to fit in within that concept. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're creating a sports bar, then the food and beverage within that sports bar should reflect that experience that you've gone out and created and that story that you've developed and food should be an enhancer. It's obviously something very tangible it's, I call food social glue. It's what brings people together. It's a bit like breaking bread. So it's hugely important. We mustn't underestimate the importance of it, but it's got to work within the overall concept. Otherwise food and beverage within that environment just isn't going to, to stack up to the grave. And when you look at venues today, you know, venues no longer have your gold, silver, bronze. We're now talking about eight, nine, 10 tiers of experience, each one being completely different. 
So that means the food in the venue has become a lot more diverse. It has to be a lot more representative, representative of all of the tiers of experience that we're trying to create. And in most cases, Liam and Rack and Paul will all tell you, each one of those environments now looks different. We're no longer walking into what was traditionally the big white hall type rooms with round tables. And almost that was 90% of your overall hospitality inventory, as we all know it from 10 years ago. So that means food and beverage can't just be a single sort of dish that you produce in a production kitchen or that you outsource and bring in and then sort of heat, hold on, re, hold on heat and regen and just served out. It's got to be completely unique to each one of these tiers of offers. And even within a tier, there could be different experiences. And the demographics are looking for different things. Some might be more drink-based, some might be more food-based, some are looking for fine dining and have to have a seat because the client they're bringing someone they want to talk to for the next two hours, and some are going into social spaces that, that, that up, an upgrade from a GA, yeah? So all food and beverage then become the company enhancer that. I think the biggest single difference is the fact that new vet generation venues have allowed these mechanics to work. We no longer just see a big production kitchen, a loading bay, and lots of regen kitchens. We now see open plan kitchens, open bars in all of these hospitality areas. And that's really allowed the chefs to flourish, the interaction, the emotional connection of the food to be much more stronger and also allows for some of the principles, as, as the guys have said, to bring in local operators and also be able to get them to connect with those customers much closer and much more confidently. Mm. Mm. And Paul, tell us about you do this at Liverpool. How, tell us about your hospitality and the different food experiences. Yeah, so I mean, look, Roy's quite right there. It's it, it's so varied now, and we just need to we we have to look at each area and treat it as individual and to see which what customers are coming through those areas. So we've got from um, premium, what you'd call I suppose fine dining, down to street food vendors within lounges now. So we're we're bringing that concourse feel into lounge space. I found probably in the last three four years, I don't know how the other guys feel about it, that that even in the premium premium areas, they still want something a little less formal. So it's it's that challenge of being providing a premium experience from a F and B perspective, but in a in a less formal way. Um, one of the ways we we did it in the main stand, so it's not massively new now, but three four years old, is we we brought the live cook units into into the executive suites. So they're 16s, 20s, 24 people boxes. Um, and that allowed us to place a chef in each box who actually cooks food in the room for the people there. So that allows the customer to uh, to uh, to choose their foods 48, 72 hours in advance. They can basically have anything they want because these units will literally cook burgers, steaks, scallops, whatever you like. It's got its own unit. So, you know, it will take away um, any smells. It'll do the extract in front of the unit. So there's no need to put anything above. So that, that gives that kind of level of flexibility. I think the other thing, we've learned is that we used to go very much for a, a, a rolling menu option. So it's from you start at one, you finish at eight, nine or 10, yeah, and then you're back to one again. And with football particularly, the games can sometimes come thick and fast if you're, if you're being successful. We don't talk about football at the moment, but, but if you are being successful and you've got a Champions League game and an FA Cup game and so on, and um, yeah, it, it means you could have you could have games four matches in you know ten days. So we now every single menu we produce is unique to that game. We we don't repeat anything, so we literally change it. We stick to the seasons as well. I think the only other thing for me is sometimes you know we can have the best chefs and the best food and the quality and local, but but finding the right people to serve this food, um, whether it be chefs or front of house, is is, is also becoming as much of a challenge, I think, as coming up with the ideas as well. Uh, we, we changed our model of recruitment um, to a more uh, assessment-based recruitment, and that's for every single member of staff. So everybody we employ, we employ through a, uh, an assessment-based interview. So it's not just a traditional one-on-one. -on -one. We're literally recruiting and making sure we've got the right people, the right attitude and the right personality, because we work on the basis that we can train a lot of this stuff in. Not everything. You need to be a trained chef to be a chef. But... There are certain things we can train in. So I think sometimes the, the people are, we, we can all come up with the greatest ideas, greatest concepts, but um, you need the right people to be able to deliver it as well. But I, but I do think that things feel to be moving to a, a more less formal kind of um, environment than what it used to be probably five or six years ago. Yeah, I had, I had a great experience with staff is recruit for attitude, train for skills. And I think, you know, it's really important thinking about all the touch points, not just what's, what, the, you know, what people are eating, but, you know, as you say, how it's served, the, you know, all of that goes to creating that ambience and creating that kind of branded experience. 
Liam, I know you're working on the new um, co-op live arena, which we're all very excited about. So can you give us a preview of any of the plans for hospitality and, and food service? Yeah, I can give you a, a little little bit of a, an insight. So yeah, you're quite right. I'm the new uh, lead designer for the co-op live arena in Manchester, which is a live music venue. It's going to be the, the biggest uh, capacity in the UK. Um, and really just echoing from what the guys are saying I think all of the points they're saying are valid and everybody it is moving forward with that I mean this one's slightly different because it is more uh, music obviously majority music focused so it's different from a sporting venue it's more there's more of an ease to it it's more relaxed there is um, more of an emphasis on the beverage side of things um, we've been working very closely with Delaware North um, and what we've been doing um, is looking at different typologies, creating destinations, and you know, ultimately fantastic quality for the fans um, at all levels. Um, but one of the things that you know, we've all been to venues, we know the most annoying thing, especially at a concert, is lengthy queues. Um, so, what we've been looking at is creating some more uh, grab and go units, but really turning them on their head a little bit where we have um, theater cooking within that. So, you basically still have you know, the excitement and the drama and the theatre, the sounds and the smells, you know, the interactions with the chefs, all of the things that lure you in, but you have the ease of just grabbing what you want and, you know, self-checkout. So it, it kind of plays with that Amazon kind of uh, contactless model, but th there is still, uh, it's not quite fully contactless. Um, another thing that we've been looking at, um, and it's not necessarily around F&B, but um, an interesting trend that's happening and I think this will affect the, the premium catering side of it is looking at the the seating bowl and the associated lounge spaces and quite often um certainly within European venue design there is almost like this invisible line between the bowl and the club space and what we've been doing is looking at what our American friends do and you know they really blur that line and create these fantastic loge spaces and you know bringing the outside in and vice versa so there's a lot of different seating options in there which again uh, reflect the different catering uh, offers that will be happening it will be more relaxed it will be more poured back more sociable um, areas of you know softer sofas um, podium seating drink shelves areas to dance just all the the fun that we need in venues and that we're all dying to get back to yeah well we definitely all dying to to get back and i you know obviously covid's been a a nightmare for our industry but uh, you know i do wonder you know has it provided an opportunity to to rethink things or to accelerate new technology um i mean certainly styles of food may have to change you're going to see less kind of sharing platters and and, and buffet buffets but um rack what are levy planning for the future so Te technology is right up there for how we use technology and data-driven solutions. So be that app, self-service, frictionless, et cetera. So we're looking at how we integrate that back into venues. But hot on our agenda is sustainability. I know we've, it, it, it is a buzzword, but you know we've developed a Levy Cares Charter, which talks about what our plans are around sustainability, working towards you know the net zero planning, working with our suppliers and supply chain, um, the whole social responsibility, working with local or minor, minority owned establishments, focusing on the environment. So we've we've put some actions against all of that uh, in terms of how we resurface plant based menus, balanced meals, mindful menus, and how we weave that into um, our style of catering and offer we have within our venues. Fantastic. And Liam, I know you talked about co-op live, but um, what else? Where's the, where's the focus? I mean, what I'm finding is it's, it's kind of three points that are be becoming stronger and stronger from the briefs that we're set from clients and the briefs that we actually push back to them. But um, the first one, the big one, is the non-event day use. So these buildings are almost no longer about it's event day and yeah you can do a conference here you can do that here it's actually looking at the customer journey in in both situations now is is almost as important as just the event day um what's so important is if, if you can have those conversations early you can really bake in you know a, a series of venue in a venue and that's certainly what we've done at co-op live um so that it can operate more seamlessly um on a non-event day 
And what that kind of does to touch on to my next point, which is sustainability, which as Rack said, is a bit of a bit of buzzword, but if you can actually create something uh, from an early point that on a non-event day can help empower an entire community and be, create a sustainable community uh, and a sustainable community driven offer, um, that's you know very exciting and very dynamic. I think with sustainability, I mean, from the macro through to the micro, you're thinking, you know, construction materials and trying to get a BRIAM credit from an architectural point of view, all of that is great. But I think it needs to, you know, more thinking needs to be done about how these venues are run, you know, once the architects and the designers have, have gone and actually what the day-to-day, -day, how that can be sustainable. And then the last one that keeps coming up more and more, um, and I think is will be a real game changer for certainly this group of people is if we think of esports and the the esports uh, venue design. So I think a lot of places just now, the bigger clubs and stuff, you can have event overlay. But how would an esports purpose-built venue in the UK change the face of hospitality? Because I think there's a tendency that, you know, we all believe it's a, it's a younger game, it's for younger people. And if that is true, what happens to the, the typical kind of hospitality um, journey from an f and B point of view? Do we actually still need a founders club? Does that is that what they want? You know, what are the spending habits for um, esports and you know all of these ideas? I think it'd be really fantastic to to work on a project like that and help because it will redefine. It'll be its own typology in its own right, where music and sports can be somewhat aligned. I think this one will be out there in its own. So those are certainly the three things that we foresee in our future of becoming. Uh, the next things to look out for. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think uh, esports is really interesting. And I think, you know, the importance of, a, you know, the non-event day audience as well. I mean, there was a session earlier with Rob Padden from Fulham talking about the new Fulham Pier and, how, you know, making that a destination in itself. Um, Roy, how, you know, where do we, where do we look to for, for trends or how, you know, how do we know what to serve people if we want it to attract those new audiences? Where do you look for trends? Yeah, I mean, in terms of food and beverage trends, you look everywhere, you know, you look on the high street, but not just the high street that we all know is in the brands. But when I say the high street, it's where people or, or consumers congregate. So when we look for at a high level tier of experience, we would probably look more at a members club. Where we look at general admission, we would probably look more at a street food. But it's not just look at them from a food and beverage perspective. It's also how the consumers use those spaces and how they interact with those spaces and also the amount of space that those spaces give a consumer. So a members club gives about 3.8 meters square per person, per consumer. You know, again, there aren't many venues in their top tier that give that sort of average spend per meter square. Uh, you know, but you know, Natasha, that that's what we look at now, yeah? You know, so that's where the future's going. It's really been able to replicate those experiences. And I don't mean copy, I mean take the DNA and the philosophy of, and then a, a appreciate how to apply them to the venues themselves and to hospitality. I would replicate on Liam's uh, comment, be just because of projects we're working on. I think as, you, as these venues have become more and more expensive, and as we're going to have to give more and more space, that makes them even more expensive they have to start generating revenue 365 days a year. I actually think they're going to be looked at completely different. I think they'll almost be looked at 330 days a year. What should these venues do? And how do, do we then start to now drive 30 days of, if it's a football stadium, of event day into those spaces? Yeah. And I also, again, working on projects, and I gave a presentation a couple of months ago on breaking the the ball and the lounges behind should now be one integrated spaces, or you should start even creating new inventory spaces where you don't have lounge space, potentially in the ball. So again, very similar trends that are sort of popping out there. And when you look at the social demographics, those people that might not even be coming for the game itself, although the game is the reason why they're there, you know, for some of them, the game is now becoming secondary. I mean, if you look at the US and the amount of social fans in venues, and that is where we look quite a lot in terms of our inspiration, You've got so many fans that are coming to the experience almost over the game. Obviously, if there's no game, there's no fans, there's no experience. But we've really got to balance how those fans are using the spaces. Mm, interesting. So we're nearly out of time. So just a couple of last questions from me. I'm just, you know, 
looking at technology and there have been you know various presentations today on, on new technology i mean one of the things we're seeing a lot about at the moment is the amazon tillless technology do we think that's an opportunity do you think we're in danger of losing something in our interaction with the customer is it inevitable post-covid that we need to go to to, to these kind of technology who wants to answer that <laughs> all of the above <laughs> yeah let's not lose the interaction with human beings but we do have to make the transaction more seamless and we've also got to remember that the generation every generation follows the last and every generation is exposed to something else and this generation is exposed to seamless frictionless pay methods so they're going to expect what they interact with on an everyday life when they come into venues as, and as that keeps developing on the high street and in their everyday interaction it's just going to become commonplace whether that means completely seamless you just walk in like the amazon i don't know but it's got to be frictionless and seamless to a level without losing the human interaction or i hope i really hope we never lose the human interaction but who knows yeah so we're nearly out of time. Uh, just one last question from me that's just occurred to me. You know, food is changing, customers are changing. Is there a change in the way that we're doing the catering deals themselves? I know um, Paul obviously self-operates, but Rack, are you, you know, I mean, it used to be that caterers were asked to pay huge sums of money and, and you know, you have these long 10, 20 year deals and the venue almost didn't get involved in the catering. They kind of handed it over to you. Um, I wonder, if, is that changing? It is. We're seeing a lot more partnership approach now because food and beverage is so integral to venues now as part of that match day experience. Roy's, everyone's mentioned it on the call. It's it's part of that fan experience. It's not just about the football on the pitch or the cricket, whatever it is. It is an integral part of that overall experience. So it's a lot more partnership. Yeah. So venues getting more involved and actually taking responsibility for you know their brand and activating yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think we're pretty much out, out of time now. So, I mean, I could talk about this all day, but um, thank you all very much for joining. And Paul, hopefully we'll all be up to see you at Anfield in, in real life for Katie's event in, uh, I think it's September. And uh, we look forward to trying your uh, Scouse Pies, which uh, I think is something that's pretty unique to Liverpool Football Club. So, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Yes, thanks guys. I'm like mm -hmm. Natasha said, we can't wait to be at Anfield this September. <laughs>